We can never achieve freedom in isolation. We can never be free if our brothers and sisters and other communities are not free. We can never be free if women are not free, because that is our red line. So in that sense, I would like to talk about a couple of these issues. Mesopotamia is a place where actually the first state-like institution began with the ancient Sumer. This is the same place where the first ideas, the concepts of private property, developed. This is also the same place where patriarchy began to institutionalize itself. This is the place where we see in ancient mythology women fall, women clash with male gods, female goddesses being uh, destroyed. We can see this, there's enough archaeological evidence uh, to suggest that. But this is, you know, this is the same place where the, basically the forerunners of the modern nation states, capitalism and patriarchy began. This is also the same place where the first word for the concept of freedom developed, amargi, which means freedom. And coincidentally, but I don't think it's a coincidence, it also means the return to the mother. So the same place where all these forms of oppression began is also the same place where the first idea of freedom is believed to have emerged. So in that sense, if we look at that, we can see there is actually a civilizational battle going on, but it's not the classical kind of dominant history writing kind of civilization clash, um, described most prominently by Samuel Huntington, but it is a clash between the statist civilization, the hegemonic, mainstream, dominant civilization, and the civilization of the oppressed. So on one hand, you always, throughout 5,000 years of history, you have these empires, kingdoms, now you have na nation states, you have even transnational uh, agreements, institutions, and so on, who always built their system of oppression and um, in a very conscious way, but on the other hand, you always have resistance. You always have democratic uh, struggles, or maybe we don't want to use the word democratic, we can use something else, resistance struggles of the oppressed, of the excluded, of the marginalized, of the indigenous, and of women. So in that sense, if we understand the, what's going on in the, these terms, I think we will understand also ways of mobilizing against it. Um, we can see that it is not a coincidence, for example, that in, in the lands of uh, Chiapas, the Zapatistas have become an inspiration for struggling people around the world with their new articulations of what autonomy, emancipation and freedom mean. It's not a coincidence that the struggle of the Palestinian people has become uh, an issue of uh, honor and dignity for struggling people around the world. It's not a coincidence that now the most marginalized, the most brutalized, violated, killed and imprisoned people in places like the United States now chant Black Lives Matter and have become the pioneering force of democracy in the United States. These are not coincidences that struggles, that new perspectives, new paradigms, all come from the places of the voices of the most marginalized, of the most excluded. And this is what we mean when we say there is a democratic civilization going on. And, going on. and if we understand ourselves within this stream, I think we will have a much more confident way of mobilizing against the status quo system. So, what all these things have in common is, a, is basically, we can say, humanity's desire to express itself as freedom. It's based on collective memories of contexts of communities where there is still a collective memory of the fact that things were not like this before. Those who have been excluded by the status system still have uh, certain social characteristics that they still carry with them and they have maintained them through maybe millennia of self-defense and we've already defined self-defense as something beyond just me merely physical self-defense they have still retained, retained those um, elements and they are now those who are mobilizing this so of course against the nation-state system which has just arbitrarily drawn borders like rulers we've actually spoken about 100 year anniversary this year also marks the 100 year anniversary of the Sykes-Picot agreement which is basically when the French and the British took a ruler like this and just drew a line and said this is now Iraq and this is uh, Syria just very easy like that and we can see 
uh, the consequences of that still happening today. The same states refuse to take refugees uh, from those places. So uh, we can see how capitalism has brutalized the entire world, how it has stolen everything from us, how it has just completely destroyed the environment. And we can see how patriarchy may be most recently manifested in the genocide and feminicide committed by forces like Daesh has once again just gone beyond its own limits. So I was in uh, Shingal, or you know, the official name is Sinjar, the homeland of the Yazidi people who have suffered the most uh, brutal forms of genocide in the recent past. I've said that before, where women were just killed, raped, and enslaved. And for me, it was just the most historic moment ever to see um, that the answer of these women was they were actually building their own women's council of Yazidi women. They were saying the only way to survive now is to organize. The only way to survive in a meaningful way is to mobilize, organize ourselves.